So tonight, um, we're going to start off with a little review of what we went over last week in chapter 16, but our goal is to do chapter 17, 18, and 19 tonight. Um, and so last week, we, we uh, took a look at the life of Asa, and tonight we're going to take a look at, the, at his son, uh, Jehoshaphat. So just a little review. Last Sunday, we took a look at the life of Asa, king of Judah. We remember Asa started out as a strong, on fire follower of the Lord. Life went pretty well for godly King Asa. For the first 10 years of his reign, there was peace and prosperity. Then a huge test came in the form of one million men aimed at, annihilation, at, aimed at the annihilation of Judah. Asa, Asa cried out to God, and God delivered the victory. Asa passed the test with flying colors, but there was a warning. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, you will find him. You will, <laughs> if you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Twenty-five more years of peace and prosperity go by before the next test comes. This one came by Baasha, king of Israel, who built a checkpoint on the main road in and out of Jerusalem. This was a, f- a far smaller foe, but it proved to be a huge stumbling block for Asa. Asa paid ben king of Syria, instead of praying, and, and praying to and seeking God. Asa's worldly plan worked. The ungodly king of Syria attacked their Jewish brothers in the north and put an end to Baasha's building of Ramah. The worldly wind earned a rebuke from the Lord, which was delivered by Hananah, the prophet. Asa raged at the rebuke, imprisoned the prophet, and failed the test. The next test came more quickly. Asa became diseased in his feet and sought a doctor, but not the great healer. Asa failed his final test, but graduates from earth to heaven. We learned an important lesson from the life of Asa. Don't look too long at the earthly distractions which hinder us. Keep looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Okay, so a little background. Jehoshaphat means the Lord is judge. Jehoshaphat was 35 years old when he became king, and he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. From approximately 783 B.C. to about 848 B.C., Jehoshaphat received an excellent heritage from his father Asa, who in in the early years of his reign was reforming the kingdom and seeking God. Jehoshaphat and his father are bright lights against the dark paganism which existed in their time. Both father and son had certain weaknesses, but their faith in the Lord brought good to themselves as well as the people during their reign. All right, so let's start in chapter 17, verse 1. Then Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel. And he placed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which his father had taken. Now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the ways In the former ways of his father David, he did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not according to the acts of Israel. Ahab is the king in Israel at this time. Ahab is married to Jezebel. You may have heard of them. Ahab is by far the most wicked king in Israel. He and Jezebel have introduced um, Idol, <laughs> idol worship on a scale that had never been seen before in either kingdom. Ahab is a weak man who is greatly controlled and influenced by desperately wicked and ungodly Jezebel. Together they created the perfect storm of evil and wickedness. Because they are in control of Israel, there is great wisdom in what Jehoshaphat is doing here, strengthening himself and Judah against the desperately wicked rule of Ahab in Israel. Jehoshaphat is fortifying cities and garrisons, refusing idol worship. He is walking with, seeking, and obeying God. So life is good in Judah. The kingdom of Israel is going the complete opposite direction, seeking idols, participating in child sacrifice, and and pagan worship. So verse 5. 
Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand, and all Judah gave presents to Jehoshaphat. He had riches and honor and in abundance. He took, and his heart took delight in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he removed the high places and wooden images from Judah. People see the anointing of God on Jehoshaphat, his good administration. He wins, and, and his good administration. He wins their approval, their support, and their respect, and their tribute. There's peace joyfulness, and a contentment which comes upon us when we are in a right relationship with the Lord. When we remove the things which hinder our knowledge of and walk with the Lord, we are seeking Him, receiving from Him, obeying Him. Things just seem right, good, and peaceful. It's a wonderful place to be in the peace of the Lord. So verse 7, also in the third year of His reign, He sent elders, Ben-Hail, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nethiel, Micaiah, to teach in the cities of Judah. And with them he sent Levites, Shemaiah, Nethiah, Bethadiah, Asel, Shemiramoth, Jehothanan, uh, Adadaniah, Tobiah, and Tobabaniah, the Levites. And with them Ishma and Jehoram, the priests. So they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them. They went throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. Jehoshaphat sends teachers out to teach the people of Judah about the Lord and his commands. Proverbs 9.10 tells us, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Jehoshaphat removes idols and fills the void left behind with truth. It is not enough to stop doing things we are not supposed to do. We have to start doing things we are supposed to do. Don't leave empty spaces. Fill them with the word of God and, world, and godly practices. Paul taught us in Ephesians 4, 22 through 32. And I'll read. That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, put away lying. Let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it might impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed, for the day of redemption." Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. If we stop doing, if we stop doing things, there's no progress. The Christian life is about growth and moving forward, all while it being in step with our Lord. There is so much more to the, the Christian life than putting off. There needs to be a putting on, living out his precepts. Verse 10. And the fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the land that were around Judah, so that they did not make war against Jehoshaphat. Also, some of the Philistines brought Jehoshaphat presents, silver as tribute, and the Arabians brought him flocks, 7,700 rams and 7,700 male goats. Solomon tells us in Proverbs 16, 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. So God caused a fear of the Lord to fall over the land, and the enemies of the past wanted peace and paid tribute to Jehoshaphat. Verse 12, 
So Jehoshaphat became increasingly powerful. He built fortresses and cities in Judah. He had much property in these cities. And the men of war, mighty men of valor, were in Jerusalem. All right, so God's, God blesses Jehoshaphat's reign, and the kingdom grows in power, prosperity, and in peace. Verse 14. There are numbers according to their father's houses, or these are the numbers according to their father's houses of Judah, the captains of thousands. Adonah, the captain, with him 380,000 mighty men of valor. Next to him was Jehonanan, the captain, and with him 280,000. And next to him was Amesha, son of Zikri, who was willing who willingly offered himself to the Lord, and with him 200,000 mighty men of valor. Of Benjamin, Elida, a mighty man of valor, and with him 200,000 men armed with bow and shield. And next to him was Jehozabad, and with him 180,000 prepared for war. These served the king, besides those the king put in the fortified cities throughout all Judah. So that's 1,186,000 mighty men of valor. This is an unimaginable number of warriors for this time in history. Judah is clearly the superpower in the, re- in the region, and Jehoshaphat is Judah's most powerful king. Chapter 18, verse 1. Jehoshaphat had riches and honor and abundance, and by marriage he allied himself with Ahab, Yes, that is correct. Jehoshaphat is no longer protecting himself from Judah, protecting himself or Judah from Ahab. They are now allies. A number of years have passed, and Jehoshaphat is allowing himself to do something he would have never allowed himself to do at the beginning of his reign. This compromise by Jehoshaphat nearly wipes out the Davidic line. Jehoshaphat allied himself with Ahab, we are not told why, but there may be a clue in 1 Kings 18, which occurred 9 to 14 years prior to this. In 1 Kings 18 is um, Elijah's Mount Carmel victory. We remember when Elijah had the showdown and victory over the 450 prophets of Baal. The Lord showed himself strong, and all the people believed in him. At the end of this account, we read about the Israelites' reaction. That's found in 1 Kings 18.39. And it reads, Now, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. I'm not sure if Jehoshaphat believed the kingdom of Israel had changed their wicked ways and had hoped to unify the two kingdoms. Whatever caused Jehoshaphat to drop his guard, they are now allies. Jehoshaphat's son... Jehoram, marries Ahab and Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah. We know Athaliah from 2 Kings 11. The story tells us that her husband and son died. Then Athaliah killed all but one of the heirs to the throne of David. These were her own grandchildren. Then she declares herself queen of Judah. Though Jehoshaphat's compromise Compromise the Davidic, the, or through Jehoshaphat's compromise, the Davidic line was re- reduced to one child who was hidden away by Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is making decisions without praying. He is making plans and then asking God to bless them. This is a really bad plan. Joe Foch gave a sobering warning during his teaching of this portion of Scripture. He said, No sin is committed unto its own. Sin does not just affect us. It affects everyone around us. He explained that we might be able to compromise, go to church, do our Christian stuff, and get away with it. But our kids see our hypocrisy and compromise in our lives. More is caught than taught, and the devil is patient. He has been doing this for thousands of years. Our compromise may never take us down, but the devil is willing for our compromise to affect our kids or our grandkids. So Jehoshaphat and Ahab are now family. A king once compared 
to David is now yoked through marriage to the most wicked king in Israel. So we'll pick up in verse 2. After some years, he went down to visit Ahab in Samaria. And Ahab killed sheep and oxen in abundance for him and the people who were with him and persuaded him to go up, to, to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. So Ahab throws a barbecue for Jehoshaphat and asks him to go to war with him over Ramoth Gilead. Ramoth Gilead is an, important ter- is an important city in the territory of Gad near the border of Israel. Moses had designated Rez- Ramoth Gilead as a city of refuge, so there is historical significance. Because of its stri- st- tr- <laughs> easy for me to say, strategic location near the border of Ramoth Gilead was frequently a scene of battles between Israel and Syria. Verse 3. So Ahab, king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as you are, my people as your people. We will be with you in the war. There are several things wrong with Jehoshaphat's answer. I am as you are? Jehoshaphat and Ahab could not be two more completely different people. In 2 Corinthians 6.14, we read, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? As children of God, we should never attempt to be relatable to worldly people through through worldliness. Acting, or worse yet, being worldly, makes us vulnerable to sin. This worldliness then disqualifies us from being useful for the Lord. My people as your people, as fellow servants of the Lord, as Christians, any people we are around, serving with or ministering to, are not ours. They belong to the Lord. We will be with you in the war. Those, this is one of those fire-ready aim situations we often get ourselves into. Having things out of order, then asking God to bless it, is the perfect plan for disaster in finding ourselves outside God's will. Verse 4. Also Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire for the word of the Lord today. Jehoshaphat has not taken up worship idol, or idol worship, sorry. He has a heart for the Lord to be in, or remain in God's will, we must seek the Lord, discover his plan or will for us, and then through obedience move forward as he directs us. Plan and then pray is never a good option for Christians looking to obey God's word. Verse 5. Then the the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, 400 men, and said to them, Shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? So they said, Go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? Jehoshaphat sees what is happening here, and he knows it's not of the Lord. The peace of God has left him. Colossians 3.15 tells us, And let the peace of God rule in our hearts to which you also were called in one body, and be thankful. The peace of God is a very important tool we use to determine the will of God for our lives. When you are in a situation and the peace of God leaves, there's something wrong. When this happens, we must stop and determine what is wrong, change our course, and return to God's will. Pick back up in verse 7. So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one man by whom we may require, inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. He never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. He is Micaiah, son of Imla. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say such things. Ahab tells Jehoshaphat he hates the prophet of the Lord. Ahab's words shocked Jehoshaphat who should have realized Christians, true followers of the Lord, don't hate anything from the Lord. 
we may be and should be challenged by hard truths, but we must see the loving heart behind them. Matthew 7.18 tells us, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. And uh, Jehoshaphat should have seen this. Verse 8, Then the king of Israel called to one of his officers and said, Bring Micaiah, the son of Imlah, quickly. We find out later Ahab knows right where to find Micaiah because he's being kept in prison. Verse 9, The king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, clothed in their robes, sat each on his throne. And they sat at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. Now Zedekiah, the son of Shenanah, had made horns of iron for himself. And he said, Thus says the Lord, With these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand. This had to be quite an uncomfortable place for Jehoshaphat to be. He loves the Lord, even though he has traveled far outside God's will for him. You know, everything about this production is telling him this is wrong. But he stays. Is it because of his son's marriage to Athaliah? I'm not sure. It is not going to be some obvious or major thing that will cause us to start down the road of compromise, ultimately causing separation between us and the Lord. It will be a little compromise with a friend or someone you love that will start you down this road of separation. Verse 12, Then the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Now listen, the words of the prophet are... The words of the prophet with one accord encouraged the king. Therefore, please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak encouragement. So everyone, including the messenger, is excited about Ahab's false prophet pep rally. They all know Micah will not go along to get along. The messenger tries to get Micah to be encouraging for once. Verse 13, And Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, whatever my God says, that I will speak. May this same thing be said of everyone here who stands up and proclaims God's word. Verse 14. Then he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramath Gilead, or shall I refrain? And he said, Go and prosper. They shall be delivered into your hand. When Micaiah came in and saw Jehoshaphat seated on the throne next to Ahab, there must have been a visual exchange. Two godly men in a pagan place, one by choice, the other by force. Micaiah knew as much as Jehoshaphat should have known. Neither Jehoshaphat or Micaiah belonged there. Verse 15, So the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you, telling, that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord. I'm sure Ahab never made Micaiah swear to tell the truth. But however Micaiah said this to Ahab, Ahab knew Micaiah was not being truthful. Verse 16, Then he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. Micaiah basically announces, Ahab, you're a dead man. Verse 17, And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you he would not prophesy good concerning me but evil? Ahab looks at Jehoshaphat and tells him, I told you so. This guy never says anything nice about me. But what good can a good and godly prophet say about a wicked and godly king. Verse 18, Then Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and his left. And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab, king of Israel, to go up, that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner, another spoke in that manner. 
Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord. And the Lord said, and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, in what way? All right, so please remember, this is a vision given to Micaiah, so he can describe it to Ahab and Je- Jehoshaphat. The Lord is all-knowing. He does not have to ask the Spirit any questions for his benefit. The question is asked for Micaiah's benefit, and for all who are listening to Micaiah describe the vision. Verse 21, so he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in all the mouths in, all, in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, You shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. These two verses cause people problems because of the proximity of the Lord to what is occurring here. In the book of Job, we read, Satan has access to the Lord in heaven, and the Lord uses spirits, kings, and people to accomplish his perfect plan. Pick up in 23. Then Zedekiah, son of Shenanah, went near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way did the spirit from the Lord go from me to speak to you? And Micaiah said, Indeed, You shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide. Then the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah, return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in prison and feed him with the bread of affliction and the water of affliction until I return in peace. Ahab orders Micah back to prison with half rations until Ahab's safe return. Verse 27, But Micaiah said, If you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he, And he said, Take heed, all you people. Lying to people who are living in sin is not a loving thing to do. Addressing sin makes things uncomfortable for everyone. It may even get you punched in the mouth. To be truthful and to tell people what they are doing is contrary to God's command is hard. But there is a pending judgment. Their soul, their their eternal destiny is at stake. Telling people about God's commands and saving grace is the loving thing to do. Micaiah is the best friend Ahab has. But Ahab doesn't know it. The opposite of love is indifference, not hate. Doing the loving thing, the good thing, will never win us favors with the Ahabs in the world. We have to make peace with that. But doing the loving thing is what God has called us to. What would have happened if at this point Jehoshaphat would have looked over at Ahab and said, I'm not doing this. The Lord is not in this. If you continue down this road, you are going to be killed. I do not want to be a part of you being killed. Especially, do not want you to die without knowing God and who he is. I have no peace with what I have seen here and heard here. I do not believe you or these prophets even know who God is. If you want me to introduce you to the all-powerful God of creation, we can do that now. If not, I'm leaving and I'm taking Micaiah with me. Please remember, Jehoshaphat was the one with the million men army now. He is the most powerful leader in the region. If he would have refused to go with Ahab, Ahab probably would have not have gone to the battle of Ramoth Gilead. Let's not make ourselves co-conspirators with the Ahabs in this world. Let us not make our co- ourselves co-conspirators with Satan and help him steal another soul into eternal darkness. Ahab does not do this, though. He ignores all the warnings and takes the easy route. He also ignores the prophet of the Lord being struck for speaking the truth. I can almost hear Jehoshaphat talking to himself, trying to Christianize his actions. Well, I don't want to upset Ahab. He said he's a Christian, and who am I to judge? Besides, I already told him I'd go with him, and the men are all assembled. It'd be embarrassing now if I backed out. 
Let your yes be yes, right? Oh, and God, please bless this mess. Verse 28. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into, into battle, but you put your robe on, or you put on your robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself, and they went into battle. Ahab is showing his true colors here. He wanted Jehoshaphat's powerful army, and he does not care anything for Jehoshaphat. Remember, the opposite of love is indifference, not hate. Ahab does seem a little concerned about the prophecy of Micaiah. He uses Jehoshaphat's compromised position to his advantage. I can almost hear Ahab talking to himself. I'll wear soldier clothes in the case that that rotten Micaiah is right. The Lord won't know it's me. They will think Jehoshaphat is me, and they'll kill him. I wonder if I get his army if he dies. Verse 30. Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of, of the chariots who were with him, saying, Fight no one, small or great, but only the king of Israel. So it was, when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, It is the king of Israel. Therefore they surrounded him to attack. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him, and God diverted them from him. So it was, when the captains of the chariot saw it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. We are not told what Jehoshaphat cries out. I imagine after all the warnings he received and ignored, and the realization of what he has done and the possible ramifications came crashing down on him, whatever he cried out, it was loud. As we learned in our, study last, in our last study, God will be found by those who seek him. God has showed himself strong on, beh- on Jehoshaphat's behalf and protected him. Verse 33. Now a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. So he said to the driver of his chariot, Turn around and take me out of the battle, for I am wounded. Please remember how hard God tried to reach Ahab. God sent five prophets to meet with Ahab before his death. The first is found in 1 Kings 18, 17 through 40. The second is found in 1 Kings 20, 22. The third is found in 1 Kings 20, 34 through 43. The fourth is found in 1 Kings 21, 1 through 16. The fifth one being this encounter with Micaiah. We should not ignore warnings from God. Ahab was given so many chances to turn to God and repent, but Ahab refused. There is a last day for all of us, just like there was for Ahab. This random arrow shot by a random archer was not random at all. Slung to signify Ahab's last day on earth, this arrow was a guided missile sent by God putting an end to Ahab's life and reign. Verse 34. The battle increased that day, and the king of Israel propped himself up in his chariot, facing the Syrians until evening. About the time of sunset, he died. Remember, Jehoshaphat did not accompany Ahab in this battle by himself. Jehoshaphat, the faithful man of God, took the mighty men of valor into the battle with him. We are not told, but we can infer from the text that many good men, godly men, lost their lives in this battle. Men, women, and children in Judah lost husbands, dads, uncles, brothers, and sons in this battle. Jehoshaphat's sin did not just affect him. It affected those around him. Then evening came, and eternal darkness enveloped Ahab. All right, so chapter 19, verse 1. Then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to his house in Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanana. Okay, so this is Hanana, the prophet who talked to Asa. This is Jehu, his son, not Jehu, the crazy chariot driver we read in Kings. So Jehu, the son of Hanana, the seer, went out to meet him and and said to King Jehoshaphat, Should you help the wicked... And love those who hate the Lord. 
Therefore the the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Nevertheless, good things are found in you, that you have removed wooden images from the land and have prepared your heart to seek God. Here we read about the largest difference between Jehoshaphat and his father Asa. Jehoshaphat receives the rebuke. We are all going to mess up. We are all going to find ourselves in situations, mostly of our own making, where we lose the peace of God. We find ourselves where we shouldn't be, and the alarm bells are going off. When the rebuke comes, we need to take it before the Lord in prayer. If, and see if it, we need to take it before the Lord in prayer and see if any part of the rebuke is valid. If it is, change what needs to be changing and repent. Apologize to whomever you need to apologize and seek their forgiveness. Then return. Get up. Dust yourself off. And get back in the battle. Whatever God has given you to do, go do it. This is exactly what we see Jehoshaphat doing here. In verse 4 we read, Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, and he went out again among the people of, from Beersheba to the mountains of Ephraim, and brought them back to the Lord God of their fathers. Then he set judges in the land throughout all the fortified cities of Judah, city by city, and said to the judges, Take heed to what you are doing, for you do not judge for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the judgment. Now, therefore, let the fear of of the Lord be upon you. Take care to do it. There is no iniquity with the Lord our God, no partiality, no taking of bribes. Moreover, in Jerusalem, for the judgment of the Lord, for controversies, Jehoshaphat appointed some of the Levites and priests and some of the chief fathers of Israel when they returned to Jerusalem. And he commanded them, saying, Thus you shall act in the fear of the Lord, faithfully and with a loyal heart. Whatever case comes before you from your brethren who dwell in their cities, whether bloodshed, whether of bloodshed, or offenses against, the, against law or commandment, against statutes or ordinances, you shall warn them lest they trespass against the Lord and wrath come upon you and your brethren. Do this, and you will not be guilty. And take notice, Amariah, the chief priest, is over you in all the matters of the Lord. And Zebedah, the son of Ishmael, the ruler of the house of Judah, for all the king's matters. Also, the Levites, will be officials before you. Behave courageously, and the Lord be with the good. So Jehoshaphat went throughout the land teaching the people about God, his commands, and the laws. He set judges over the people to settle disputes and enforce the laws and commands of God. He charged the officials, telling them to interact with and judge the people in the fear of the Lord. We used to do this in the United States of America, and we were greatly blessed. We currently have the most powerful military in the world, just like Jehoshaphat, but probably not for long. We have compromised and made alliances with the wicked and the ungodly, just like Jehoshaphat did. God has rebuked us, just like he did Jehoshaphat, and now God is waiting for us as a nation to repent and return. If we do, It'll be because people taught about our God. It is because people are taught about our God, his commands, and his saving grace. Government officials, teachers, policemen, tax collectors who know God and know there is a coming judgment for how they conduct themselves interact with the people they serve and govern differently than those who do not know God. We serve a God of righteousness and truth, Just like we saw with the 400 false prophets and the one true prophet, Micaiah. A majority does not make a truth. We, 
as the children of God have been, been given the truth of God in his word. We have been commissioned to share this truth with an unbelieving world. We must carry out our commission in the fear of the Lord. We are not going to do it perfectly. But when we do stumble, we know how to handle it. Repent, seek forgiveness, get back up, and get in the battle. Behave cur- courageously, and the Lord be with the good. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, um, it just is so amazing, Lord, your, um, how vast your word is. And I'm so grateful, Lord, that you give us the good and the bad with all the people that you put in, in um, your accounts, Lord. Um, it just shows us that they're just like us. And that um, we're all not perfect, and we're all not going to do the right things all the time. But you're a good and gracious God, and there's room for those things. And that you'll cover it, and you'll make sure we finish well. And for these things, we thank you. In the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ, amen.